for the function of the knee, but for the longevity of the knee. And it's almost always true that early intervention for knee injury or knee pathology is far more superior uh, than a delayed approach, except when it comes to, to joint replacement. And I'm going to touch uh, briefly at the end on what, you know, what we've been implementing at the hospitals I've been working at and what's basically regarded as rapid recovery arthroplasty or rapid recovery total knee arthroplasty and why I really think this is the way forward and why this really rocks. So this, if you look at, um, this is a great summary. Uh, it was uh, done by a surgeon in the UK and it kind of shows a spectrum of, uh, of knee pathology and also the spectrum of types of modalities which we institute before we get to, to reconstruction. The salvage is obviously, you know, completely different kettle of fish, but before we get to reconstruction, there's a lot of things we can do in the knee to try and repair what's damaged, to regenerate tissue. We can brace the knee either externally or we can brace the knee internally by means of osteotomies. And the end goal is to try and preserve function, optimize function, or at least heal tissues which are damaged. So I'm going to, I'm going to stick more around this side for most of the talk. And at the end, I'll, I'll come around um, to a bit of reconstruction. So just a, a quick recap on, on knee anatomy, uh, because it's important to understand what is there and what can be damaged. And like I mentioned before, the, the intricacies of the biomechanics and how these different parts of the knee interact with each other uh, are becoming more apparent to us with time uh, and with more investigations and more advanced treatment modalities, you know, it's becoming a lot clearer. Uh, but obviously that's a bit more uh, beyond the scope of this talk. But essentially we have the articular cartilage which coats the joint surfaces. We have our ligaments, both the collateral and the cruciate ligaments, which gives stability both in the, in the coronal plane, which is your collateral ligaments in the sagittal plane. Uh, for, for your cruciate ligaments, anterior and posterior translation. And then we have the meniscus on either side, which basically act as shock, shock absorbers to distribute the weight and protect the articular cartilage. In knee pathology, we can sort of broadly differentiate it into traumatic and then your degenerative or your non-traumatic uh, types of injuries. And right? obviously this is nowhere near comprehensive, but just at least, I think the most of the common ones that most of us would encounter in our daily practice. So from the traumatic ones, you know, ACL, uh, probably the most common, commonly injured uh, ligament in the knee, uh, those meniscus tears are very common as well and usually often, almost always associated with some sort of ligament tear. Articular cartilage lesions, uh, sometimes in my opinion is that they're a bit um, neglected. We don't always look for them, um, but um, you know, there are modalities which we can implement to, to try and, and uh, fix these early. Um, patella dislocations and, you know, recently the, the medial patellofemoral ligament as a stabili stabilizer for, for the knee has, has, has uh, become uh, more apparent to us. Um, also modalities to try and treat that also become more apparent. And less commonly PCLs, lateral corner, posterior medial corner, which are also things a bit beyond the scope of this talk. Degenerative, I mean, uh, osteoarthritis, uh, obviously, well, one of the most common conditions and one of the top five causes of disability worldwide. Um, osteochondral lesions and cysts, also similar to osteoarthritis, but more focal. And then as opposed to traumatic meniscus tears, degenerative tears are also very common. Baker's cysts, I'm sure, is something that we all come across and sort of rack our brains to how to treat this. Uh, it's really, I call it the headache of the knee because it's so sometimes very difficult to treat. And then gout is something we always need to keep in the back of our minds, not really a mechanical cause of knee pain, uh, but uh, always something we need to keep in mind for patients with knee pain and no other explanation. So I'm going to start with, uh, you know, just a, a scenario, you know, so a patient comes in uh, with an acute hemoarthrosis and, uh, uh, you know, a simple twisting of the knee or fall onto the knee or after a car accident. And this is generally um, the picture you, you've given, right? And then there's a patient with a traumatic hemoarthrosis. Uh, he's sometimes in pain, sometimes actually not so painful, uh, but you can see they've got a lot of blood in the knee and you kind of figure out, trying to think now, okay, how to approach this, right? Um, so the things that go through my head, for, for hemoarthrosis to occur, there must be something in the knee that's injured, right? So it's either a fracture, but we're assuming now, uh, you know, this patient doesn't have a fracture, we're assuming it's a normal or relatively normal X-ray, right? 
So either a fracture or osteochondral defect, which is a piece of cartilage with bone, either cruciate ligament tear, um, patella dislocation is something we always need to keep in mind, or is there a meniscus tear that's causing this type of diffusion? Just remember that collaterals are extra articular, they're outside the joint, uh, and they don't really cause, typically cause a hemoarthrosis in isolation. And even more so, they're very, very rarely injured uh, in isolation. The history of the mechanism is always important and helpful just to guide uh, your management and just your thought process. So, and these can be broadly broken into either a direct contact. So for example, uh, a soccer player runs into to another player and hits him either on the inside and the outside of the knee. And based on the direction, you can kind of get an idea of uh, which direction the knee may have been deformed into and what structures may have been injured. Dashboard injuries are also quite common. Um, we have patients involved in a head-on collision, then he hits the dashboard and the PCL uh, can get injured. Um, also in this, these cases, you've got to look at the hips, you've got to look at the spine as well to see if there's any uh, transmission of force through the axial skeleton. And then you have your indirect um, injuries, which are so sometimes a bit more subtle. Uh, you know, you don't really expect an injury uh, for something, you know, with relatively minor trauma. But certainly, you know, we've seen a lot of uh, ACLs and, and meniscus injuries from these types of uh, simple trips and falls or, or, you know, just a short term without any contact with anybody else. So this can help you in guiding you what you think might be going on. Right. And then again, here, you know, just looking at the direction, we can try to get an idea of uh, what's injured. So with the, with, with the valgus force, the medial collateral ligament, with the varus force, the lateral collateral ligament, uh, rotation, you know, where we have a plant foot, for example, when you're wearing soccer boots or uh, spikes for that matter, and you have some you know, uh, sudden rotation of the upper body, this can cause strain of ligaments in the middle of the knee, so uh, your creature ligaments or your meniscus. And then hyperextension uh, also um, can cause capillary sprain and or, or commonly uh, cruciate ligament injury. So what can guide you on the history is where the pain is, right? So definitely medial or lateral joint line uh, or um, medial retinaculum in the case of uh, patella dislocations. And then also the onset of the effusion. So if you have an immediate large tense effusion, this is usually an ACL tear. Uh, they tend to give you your larger effusions, your meniscus tears or your ligament sprains, so not a complete tear, tend to give you more slow sort of grumbling effusions that um, patients sometimes present with a bit late. And then in mechanical symptoms that may be occurred at the time of the injury or have been occurring since the injury, popping sound at the ACL is, popping sound is usually a very common um, report from patients who've had an ACL uh, tear or injury. They just, they, they jumped and they landed and had a pop and then the knee was a bit sore and then you got swollen. Very common, especially in young ladies. Uh, locking or locking of the knee usually indicates a, some sort of mechanical blockage to motion. And uh, that's usually your meniscus injuries. So there's a number of tests and I'm sure we, you know, I remember going through these in medical school and I could never get my head around it till much later on in my training. Um, but in a patient with an acute hemoarthrosis, um, this is very difficult to do much of these tests. So, I kind of narrow it down to just my Lachman test, um, the collateral ligament stress test and the patella apprehension or modified version of the patella apprehension. I think it's really difficult, especially in a tense effusion, a very tender patient, especially if they had a uh, you know, direct trauma to the knee, uh, if they, you know, to do all these other tests. And I think it's a bit uh, uncomfortable. In the chronic ones, sure, you, know, you, can, you, can, you can gauge how the patient is responding and, and use the rest of your tests. But in, in the acute hemoarthrosis, this is probably what I rely on most. So your Lachman test, uh, you stabilize the femur with one hand, you stabilize the tibia with the other. I always tell the patients to try and relax their hamstrings as much as possible because what you're essentially trying to look for is an ACL injury. So if they're tensing their hamstrings, they're pulling the tibia back towards the femur. So you may have a false sense of how stable it is. But this is a relatively sensitive test for, for ACL injury. And you basically want to translate the, the tibia forward uh, to see if there's any laxity. And we generally talk about either a hard endpoint and a soft endpoint. And you know, after a while, you kind of get, get the hang of it. Various and valgus stress tests. Different people have different ways of doing it, but essentially you can either put the foot into your axilla or you can use a hand to stabilize it and simply push the, the foot into either varus or valgus. Now there's very, there's lots of different theories about whether to do it full extension, 30 degrees or 90 degrees, et cetera. 
So it's kind of a rule of thumb. If the knee is, has various or valgus laxity at, uh, at full extension, it indicates to me that there's likely a collateral plus a cruciate ligament injury. If there's a laxity only at 30 degrees, then usually the, the cruciate is intact and it might just be a collateral ligament injury. So I usually test them at zero and then at 30 degrees as well. And then for patella instability, it's called your patella apprehension test. Maybe a bit difficult in your, in your acute setting, but basically hang the leg off the bed for about 30 degrees. And you want to slowly want to translate the patella uh, laterally. Uh, patients with acute dislocations, with the hemoarthrosis, and you're not quite sure where it's coming from, uh, you, you, you sometimes might, they might get a lot of tenderness uh, on the medial retinaculum, so the medial side of the patella, also on the lateral femoral condyle because from the bone edema, and just looking for that and can op often reveal, especially, you know, I've seen patients come in who are in ICU, coming for a head injury, whatever the case may be, they've got a knee hemoarthrosis, knee is kind of stable, and then you do an MRI and you realize, okay, the medial retinaculum is torn, they've had a patella dislocation. So just something to keep in mind. It's not always the cruciate, so the meniscus, definitely the patella uh, is something you should always look for. And then your investigations, your options are basically plain x-rays. In this situation, we're assuming that your plain x-rays are normal, right? When it comes to ultrasound, I really don't personally feel there's much benefit for an ultrasound in acute uh, hemoarthrosis of the knee. It doesn't give you much information about the, the intra-articular structures. Uh, if you're suspecting maybe a patella tendon rupture or a quadriceps tendon rupture, which we're not discussing here, uh, which you probably would pick up clinically anyway in terms of uh, the lack of extension, uh, then maybe an ultrasound would be helpful. But in terms of, you know, just a hemoarthrosis with, uh, you know, with the patient who's still walking or, you know, partial weight bearing, you're suspecting intra-articular pathology, I don't think ultrasound has much benefit uh, in your chronic patients who are coming with possible Baker cysts, definitely use an ultrasound to try and assess the size of that Baker cyst, uh, but it's not going to give you much indication of what's causing the Baker cyst, and Baker cysts are usually a result of some sort of intra-articular pathology. MRI, I still think, is the gold standard for diagnosis of intra-articular pathology. I remember um, we did part of our, you know, we used to do sessions at uh, Sports Centre at the University of Pretoria, and, um, you know, you know, for sport, for, for any sportsman with any type of knee injury, they literally went from the field straight to an MRI. And I think with increased availability of MRI nowadays, we should actually use it more for our patients with acute hemorrhage process, get a diagnosis and, and get moving with treatment. But then again, you know, working in private practice, we always have these uh, constraints. So there are definitely patients who are going to come to you, especially those without medical aid and who don't have access to an MRI. So I've kind of narrowed it down to, to what I look for in the patients where I really can't get an MRI or the patient is willing to have an MRI. So I look for indications for emergent intervention. So is the knee grossly unstable? Was this a dislocated knee that relocated, right? Is there a vascular injury? And that obviously, you know, triggers a whole different pathway in terms of treating this patient because the priority in that, in that situation is getting stability and then checking for and treating vascular injury. Is the knee locked or is the mechanical block to full extension? Usually this is your bucket handle meniscus, which is sitting inside the notch and preventing the knee from moving. This, this for me is an emergency and uh, I, would, I would probably take the patient to theater uh, to try and unblock that, uh, that, menis the, that meniscus and try and, and save it as best as possible. Is the patient able to weight bear? You know, is it not a subtle fracture or something that's, uh, that's causing the problem? Usually patients with ligaments or meniscus tend to be able to weight bear with difficulty, but if the patient's really unable to weight bear, that, that is a bit of a trigger for me to, to investigate further. Uh, in terms of uh, tense effusion, this can be very difficult you know, to send a patient home with a, a tense effusion and say, look, let's wait for it to settle down. Sort of more milder effusions tend to settle down with time and after that gives you a bit of chance to, to examine the knee. But a tense effusion is, is very difficult to send a patient home. And in these cases, I might consider aspirating the knee uh, for, for symptomatic relief or taking the patient to theater uh, aspirating the knee and then examining the knee under anesthesia to give me a better idea of uh, the stability. So assuming that none of these uh, things are, there's no sort of emergent reason for intervention, I would uh, tell the patient to do RICE, which is RICE, ice, ice, ice. rest, ice, compression, elevation, uh, start some physiotherapy, uh, and then reevaluate at the weekly intervals to see how it resolves. And once the patient settles down, then you can actually examine the knee properly. Um, the other option is arthroscopy. Uh, the important thing is that if you're going to do arthroscopy on a patient where you're not 100% sure what's injured or you're suspecting, you know, possible ACL or possible meniscus, is to have all the, 
equipment on hand and just counsel the patient preoperatively that, you know, if there is a ligament injury, you may have to take a graft, et cetera. Uh, so as long as the consent is all there, your equipment is there, you know, arthroscopy can be your, your diagnostic as well as your therapeutic option uh, in these patients. So the, basically the principles is, and you know, there's a lot of um, movements within industry as well as in the academic circles to try and save the meniscus or save the knee and save the cartilage, et cetera. Because we know that these patients who, who are deficient in the meniscus or are deficient in the cartilage will develop osteoarthritis later on in life. And I can tell you that these patients needed patients are significantly more challenging than your primary osteoarthritis because they've had a longer time to develop stiffness, synovitis, um, and uh, pathology in the knee. And very often they're very young, so you don't want to do a joint replacement and you kind of delay them, delay them, delay them. And then uh, it becomes a very challenging pathology with a lot of contractures and uh, soft tissue or stiff tissue to deal with. So the thing is, I always ask myself, why is there an effusion? Um, I use my examination and investigation very aggressively to try and figure out what the problem is. And arthroscopy is usually the, 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 the um, the modality of choice in treating intra-articular knee pathology. I think in terms of open knee surgery, that's become uh, relatively outdated for meniscus and uh, ligament injury. Uh, however, obviously for cartilage injuries, often we need to open and, and fix the cartilage back to bone, which we'll discuss a bit later. Is there, and then I will discuss needs for emergent intervention. And then once, you know, if there's, if there's not any of those, or um, we can decide what needs to be fixed and reconstructed and often do that uh, as an elective uh, procedure. So my message is to, you know, let's, let's be decisive. Let's try and save patients' needs because a lot of these things such as meniscus tears and osteochondral lesions and loose cartilage fragments are very time dependent. Uh, we, if we get to them after, you know, a period of a week or two weeks, it's, uh, it's, it's virtually impossible sometimes to save cartilage fragments that have come off and, and could have been reconstructed in the first place. Also, if they continue to walk on a, on a, on a torn meniscus, uh, by the time you get to it at six weeks or after, it's already sort of um, degenerated and damaged by, by weight bearing. So that's very also difficult to treat. So common conditions in the knee, which I'll just cover very briefly, and what the, sort of the current consensus is regarding the treatment is ACL tears, meniscus tears, uh, patellofemoral dislocation, and chondral injury. I'll try and source some cases as we go along. So ACL injury, probably one of the most common injuries for about almost half a million ACL reconstruction done in the US uh, alone. Uh, unfortunately, in South Africa, I don't think we have much information that because of our fragmented health system and accounts for about half of all knee injuries, right? And as I mentioned before, more common in female athletes and uh, they tend to, to, to sustain this injury at a more younger age um, than their male counterparts. Uh, and they tend to get it more on their supporting leg than males get it on their kicking leg. Uh, there's also some studies, uh, one of my supervisors did a PhD in this, and he looked at basically when uh, the hormonal influences behind females getting ACL injuries. And actually, there, it, was it was found to be, you know, related to the menstrual cycles as well, and the, the laxity and stuff that comes with the hormones. So it's interesting to see how, uh, what predisposes these uh, patients to these types of injuries. Uh, and there's also a lot of research looking into how we can uh, prevent these types of injuries. So in terms of prehabilitation, especially in patients playing netball, soccer, and any sort of pivoting injuries. So how we manage them? Uh, you really need to look at it as why you don't want to operate this patient. So either it's a very low demand patient or an elderly patient with osteoarthritis or sustained a fall. Age, I don't think is necessarily a contraindication. A lot of patients are elderly and they still play tennis, they still play golf, they're still relatively active. Uh, they may not have osteoarthritis and they want to still continue to be active without having to worry about a knee that's going to, going to fall or give way on them. So I don't really necessarily look at age as a, as a factor. I look at the patient's demand and what they want to do with that knee uh, and also then or whether they, you know, they have osteoarthritis. Um, in terms of timing of surgery or reconstruction, you decide whether is this an irritable knee or this is an acquired knee. If the patient has still got a, you know, hemoarthrosis and they, they're struggling to get the range of motion, um, and they're just not, if it's not a happy knee, uh, then I wouldn't operate that patient immediately. I'd give them time to rehabilitate, uh, let the hemat also settle down and get their full range of motion first. But some patients come in and they have, uh, you know, they've got an effusion, they've got an ACL injury, but they've still got good range of motion and the knee is in relatively good condition. And those ones you can opt to operate earlier. Uh, as I mentioned before, full range of motion preoperatively is extremely important. Uh, because uh, patients who come in with, without that full range of motion have uh, a very high risk of what's, uh, of getting post-arthrofibrosis and stiffness in the knee post-operatively. 
And so why, why do we want to operate these patients? Because we know that in the long term, they have anterior laxity and they have not only anterior laxity, but the ACL also gives you rotational stability. So to resist uh, ex excessive external rotation. And when these patients keep on, um, you know, pivoting and uh, 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 have it continues anterior laxity, they do develop damage to the cartilage and more importantly, damage to especially the posterior horn of the medial lateral meniscuses because of the anterior translation, the femoral condyles keep smashing against the, the posterior horns of the meniscus and this causes knee generation in, in the mid to long term and predominantly more on the medial than the lateral side. Not only this, but it also causes long-term change in the gait, which is very difficult to change after a while. So basically, they avoid a, we have a, what's called a quad avoidance gait. So they avoid extending the knee, because what happens is when they extend the knee, uh, the quads um, pull the, the tibia forward, which is what they, and they don't like that sensation. Um, and so they tend to walk with both, uh, what, you know, more prominently with their hamstrings, where the hamstrings will pull the tibia backwards. So changing that gait in the long term can be very difficult. And I can assure you, doing these knee replacements is quite, a lot more challenging than doing uh, standard primary osteoarthritis. So there's many, there's many different theories about how to reconstruct the ACL, because we know the ACL is broken up into two different bundles, anterior medial, posterior lateral. So, you know, at one point there was uh, uh, the move to do a double bundle ACLs to reconstruct each bundle separately, kind of move more towards single bundle repairs. And uh, I use a uh, hamstrings autograft here. Uh, basically, autograft means that we take uh, the patient's native hamstrings and we use that to reconstruct the ligament. There are many other options, and sometimes we do use these based on the patient and uh, based on you know, their preference as well. But the other option is bone patella tendon bone, where you take a piece of the patella tendon centrally and a piece of bone from the patella and a piece of bone from the tibial tubercle. Uh, and that's also pretty good because it gives you good bone to bone healing when you put those uh, that bone through the tunnels. Um, each has their own benefits and own risks associated with them. Uh, quartz tendon is also an option. Uh, and also, and then the other option is allograft. Uh, working overseas, especially in the US and Canada, allograft is um, freely available, but there they have fresh allograft uh, that obviously don't have the burden of infectious uh, disease and HIV that we do. Um, so fresh allograft is definitely, you know, uh, the gold standard for them. However, with us, uh, we don't have access to fresh allograft. We have very poor quality radiated um, allograft, which is not great for, for tendon reconstruction. Allograft may be an option, you know, for, for revision cases or for fail, previously failed cases, but uh, definitely not the primary option for most uh, surgeons in terms of uh, ACL reconstruction. And as you can see here, uh, picture on the right is this is a video of how we harvest uh, the graft. Uh, it was a very small incision. Uh, we tend to use a slightly bigger one, but uh, you basically isolate the, the tendons as they attach onto the pest and serinus and use a, a percutaneous tendon stripper to strip the tendon from the muscle and you can easily get it out and uh, double that or quadruple that to form a new ACL uh, through tunnels uh, in the, the ephema and the tibia. Um, and then also with ACL injuries, important to look for associated injuries. So your know, MCL injuries are very common, meniscus tears, chondral injuries, and also to always check for your, for your posterior and your posterior lateral structures. But one of the reasons why ACL injuries, uh, ligament reconstructions fail is because patients are malalignment, either excessive valgus or varus, or they have a very uh, high slope. Uh, and and uh, it's important to look at that for each patient to see you know, if they have any of these issues you may want to go and do a osteotomy to try and correct these, these uh, deformities to prevent injury and also pre protect the cartilage in the long term. So this was a 34 year old male turned sharply, had a pop in his knee while playing soccer about five months ago. He attended physio for a while, marginal response. Initially when he came into me, he was uh, uh, very irritable in the knee, um, really reluctant to flex and extend, but there was no mechanical blocks of motion at the time. Um, so, I did an MRI, which clearly shows he had a complete ACL rupture. Also, he had a tear of the posterior horn of the, of the lateral, as well as the medial meniscus. Uh, and you can see on the, on the actual images, lots of uh, blood in the knee. Um, so we, we gave him a chance to, to settle down. About six weeks, we took him to theater and we did an ACL reconstruction. Just chatted with the physio yesterday and he's basically on his way to start uh, hopefully running soon. So. You know, it's good to get feedback from your physios and have a good team around you because 
I think the success of this procedure is only 50% the surgery. I think 50% is predominantly your, your reconstruct, I mean, your, your rehabilitation that the patient receives post-operatively. Um, so it's good to have a good team and uh, who's in, in touch with you and in touch with the patient and the free flow of communication to allow these patients to rehab appropriately. And I always tell the patients that, you know, if you're playing soccer, you want to go back to soccer, it's at least a year before you can go back to competitive play. And that's the same goes for professional players. Once they have an ACL injury, it's at least a year before they go back to competitive play. Um, so it's, it's a long rehabilitation process, but definitely worth it in the long term. I know my brother had one many years ago, and he's back to squatting one to 200 kgs and et cetera. But he also, you know, he did a very extensive program of rehabilitation. So there's no point doing this operation if the patient's not prepared to go through with rehabilitation. So sometimes, you know, we have to choose our patients based on those who we think are going to benefit and we're going to actually follow through with the rehabilitation. Meniscus tears are the traumatic type. Um, there's lots of literature looking at different um, patterns of uh, meniscus tears so for your longitudinal, horizontal, radial tears, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, this is important to remember that the meniscus is a non-vascularized structure. And uh, you know, with the exception of the longitudinal tears, most of them were not gonna heal by themselves uh, without some sort of external stimulation. Uh, so meniscus repair is a relatively new concept as rapidly gaining traction as a norm. Patients have meniscus repairs, we try and fix them as best as we can, early as possible. Uh, the operation called a meniscectomy, where you take out the meniscus, or term meniscus is basically a historical interest. And we know those patients have done terribly in the long term with a 100% rate of osteoarthritis needing knee replacement. And definitely better results if meniscus repair is undertaken early, so less than six weeks uh, before further damage occurs. So there's various methods of fixation that we're using. Uh, here you can see what's called outside in. So we put needles from the outside we, um, and then thread um, the sutures through and then loop them back with uh, suture, suture retrievers. Um, the, the, those are still very important, for especially your anterior horn tears. Uh, this inside out where you do the same thing, but just put the needle through the knee from the inside and then catch the sutures on the outside. And then what's very exciting is this all inside techniques is where you have a device like this, which has preloaded sutures. Um, you insert uh, the end and there's different depths that you can insert this to. You fire this, it shoots out a suture, which has a, a solid backing or peak. Uh, you pull it out, you zap it in again, you shoot another suture and that gives you, and then you can tighten and then it loosens the, the knot. You're able to tie that knot down arthroscopically and cut it. And, um, basically able to do everything all, all inside as opposed to poking needles through the skin. And that's becoming uh, very popular, especially for your peripheral tears and your posterior horn tears. Anterior is a little bit difficult to get to with these, so we stick to the outside end. This is a 25-year-old male, sharp turn while playing soccer, very likely low energy injury, didn't really expect much, but he came in and as you can see from his x-ray, his knee is locked in this position. Uh, he has basically had like a spongy endpoint um, to extension and uh, he couldn't actually walk or move the knee. Um, did an MRI and as you can see, there's a meniscus or what we call a double ACL sign. The meniscus is actually flat into the notch. Uh, that's actually supposed to be there, uh, which is you know precisely why you couldn't extend the knee. So we use a combination of outside in and, and all inside sutures and uh, non-weight bearing for about six weeks. Six weeks after they came to visit me, was a discharge from physiotherapy and hopefully back to playing soccer. And then this recently described meniscus tear patterns is the root tear and the ramp lesion. Uh, the root tear is a, what they call silent epidemic. And uh, it's interesting because these patients have very low uh, energy, which causes the injury. And they don't have mechanical symptoms because it's, it's, it's a valve right at uh, insertion into the bone or within one centimeter of that and there. There's sometimes a medial joint blind tenderness, and like I said, a very minor traumatic event and very, very vague symptoms. And you really only pick this up in the MRI arthroscopy. The important thing here sorry, is that um, having this type of injury very drastically alters your knee biomechanics and your kinematics. Uh, it's almost like having no meniscus at all, because once this thing is disrupted, the, loop, the hoop stresses and that, that uh, sort of cushion effect of the meniscus is completely gone. So we definitely try and repair this. And as I mentioned before, there's no, there's no age limit. If a patient's still active and still has good cartilage, we will definitely fix this. And the modern repair techniques is to get sutures arthroscopically through there and we pull that through a tunnel and that restores that, uh, those hoop stresses and the, the length of the meniscus. 
ramp lesion is basically evulsion of the meniscus from the peripheral capsule. And this can only be seen once you put your scope into the posterior compartments. And uh, nowadays with uh, arthroscopic suture passes, we're able to get sutures through the capsule and into the meniscus and pull those through and repair the meniscus back to the capsule. Uh, also similar to root lesion, also causes a lot of biomechanical changes and kinematic changes in the knee. So when we pick these up and very commonly with ACL injuries, we try and repair them. Acute patella dislocation, very difficult from uh, your patients with recurrent instability, secondary to either anatomical variances or hyperlaxity, usually it's a direct trauma collision. And then associated with the MPFL ligament, which is a small ligament which sits on the medial side of the patella. So always reduce, and I always MRI these patients, because many of them end up having loose bodies or chondral injuries, which we may have to remove from the knee or try and fix back to bone. Um, first time dislocator, we almost never operate. We give them you know, rest, eyes, compression, elevation, Physio, with, um, you can send these patients for VMO strengthening, just indicate to the physio you wanted to do VMO strengthening. And a lot of them will hopefully not dislocate again. Uh, the repeat dislocators, we generally offer them an MPL for reconstruction. Here again, we take a hamstrings autograft and repair the tigment, uh, ligament to bone, basically like a double strand. And very straightforward, simple procedure and with really good outcomes more than 90% of the time. Chondral osteochondral injury, as I mentioned before, especially with patellar dislocations can be quite debilitating. Um, and these obviously will need to be done very early before um, degeneration of the cartilage occurs. So as you can see here, we've got nowadays is uh, special little chondral nails or chondral darts, which we can use sometimes, you know, you, you know price is an issue, you can even use uh, headless compression screws. We try and get that cartilage back into position uh, as early as possible to try and restore the knee, uh, the knee anatomy. Um, this is a 31-year-old female. Uh, she had a patellar dislocation from direct trauma, a dog ran into her. And as you can see, these small little fragments of bone um, which had come off the patella. Um, unfortunately, she was already two, or well, just over two weeks by the time we managed to take her to theater, which was a delayed presentation to us. And uh, once we got in there, it was actually quite a large fragment, about two centimeters. And this was just a small fragment of bone attached, but the cartilage was already degenerated before we could actually reattach it. So we just had to excise it, unfortunately. So try and get to these early, try and put them back onto bone early and hope that, uh, that, they, that they, uh, they heal back. So hope that wasn't too much, but I uh, just want to touch briefly on uh, joint replacement, arthroplasty and osteoarthritis in the knee. And just looking at always systemic disease and the economic impact of joint replacement, how we're trying to play our part by trying to decrease the economic impact of this uh, procedure uh, with the different pathways for, for joint replacement. Uh, so first looking at oh, it's a systemic disease, and I, I think I've showed this before, but you know, movement is life, and what movement is life is unthinkable. And uh, patients with osteoarthritis, especially of the knee, it's movement is so painful. And then I just can't imagine why, um, how you know, it's possible to live when you actually just can't move. So, you know, it's disturbing to me when I hear things from patients. And these are things I've actually heard from patients. I managed to find a love between the bedroom and the kitchen. This is a 65-year-old female with severe end-stage OA, now with bone loss and intractable pain. Like, I just don't understand how people's health-seeking behavior has come to this point where they, they, they think this is normal, right? Uh, the uh, other one is uh, patient I just saw last week. I just stay upstairs at home and have a nice garden. A 60-year-old old cardiac patient with bilateral end-stage OA, right? And they... I'm not sure whether they've never been offered surgery or they're just scared of surgery or whatever the case may be, but to live this side of type of existence for somebody who should be, in my opinion, in the prime of their life, spending time with their grandkids and their families, to live this type of existence is just unthinkable for me. Um, another male, a couple of weeks ago, I'm scared of surgery, um, 60 year old, but he had a coronary artery bypass disease, which is far more serious surgery about four years prior. And he's suffering with intractable night pain more because his wife complained. But, you know, I think just the perspective that, you know, you're scared of, you've had major surgery before, but you're scared of a different surgery doesn't make sense to me. And I think it's important that we try and change these patients' health seeking behavior so that we can alter the course of the disease. And I think, can't you just put an injection in the knee? I think I've discussed injections previously, but cortisone injections are not benign. They do have long term issues and complications. So I tend to use them very judiciously, but <clears throat> I think some patients just come expecting an injection and then when you offer them surgery or talk or anything about surgery, it becomes, you know, like 
uh, it comes a bit scary. I know it is scary, and I, I do admit to them that if I were to go for the same pledge, it would be scary. But I think what we were about to discuss further is probably a bit more scary. So in summary, you know, uh, osteoarthritis has, has severe effects on the heart, um, which I think is a bit more scary than if you just look at the disease itself, right? So there's a study from Canada. We looked at mortality and serious cardiovascular events in patients with any osteoarthritis and showed significant increase in all-cause mortality and serious cardiovascular events. And that's after controlling for multiple confounders with patients with osteoarthritis. Similar study also done in the UK. And basically they go as far as to say that cardiovascular disease, um, osteoarthritis is an indirect cause of cardiovascular disease. And this comes back to, to, to the fact that patients just don't move, right? They can't move because they're in pain. If you don't move, you become unhealthy and uh, this causes issues for your cardiac, for your cardiac condition. And then also with diabetes, there's two studies, this one done in Canada, and uh, look at osteoarthritis and, and also the, the, um, the disability with walking and found that osteoarthritis is a significant and potentially modifiable risk factor for diabetes complications. Another study also from Canada, um, and it shows that osteoarthritis is an increased risk for serious diabetic complications and actually proposed the need for improved detection and management of OA in the diabetic public. Uh, population. Sure enough, the, 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 the complications from surgery can be very devastating, but also the complications from not treating your osteoarthritis can be equally as devastating. This sort of looking at the other side, this looked at patients who had jo total joint replacement and looked at the risk and followed these patients for many years, looking for cardiovascular events. And this was uh, published in the BMJ. Um, the study found a cardioprotective event is primary elective total joint arthroplasty. So in my opinion, having a total joint replacement is equally as good as having, you know, treatment for your cardiovascular disease. Um, you know, because having the joint replacement saves you, you know, and protects you from having serious cardiovascular problems later on in life. And coming back to movement and joint pain, when patients don't move, they get, um, they get fat and they get heart disease, type two diabetes, depression, and it's, as they get bigger, it puts more pressure on the joints and they get worse joint pain, it's a vicious cycle. And eventually get to a point where, you know what, they just become too unhealthy for you to operate or the surgery becomes very high risk. So I think we need to be judicious in the sense that, you know, when patients have these diseases, that we offer them the appropriate treatment at the appropriate time, not necessarily wait till they, they get too ill. And also looking at, uh, you know, the waiting list for arthroplasty. And they did uh, basically um, uh, questionnaires looking at patients' quality of life while waiting for, for arthroplasty. And so 20% of patients had a quality of life that was worse than death. And this was mainly due to the pain. Um, so I think, you know, a lot, of, a lot of patients hear from patients when they've had the joint replacement, and they've been through the rehab, which is also very grueling and very painful. The thing they tell you is, you know, I wish I had this operation earlier. So I had more time to have quality of life. So I think it's important to, 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 to remember. And just another quote to move on is, life is moving. Once you stop moving, you're dead to choose life. And that ties in perfectly with the previous uh, study, which shows that, you know, having this pain and waiting for joint replacement uh, can sometimes be worse than just dying itself. So in summary, the, the burden of always growing rapidly and the need for joint replacement is definitely going to rise. And untreated OA certainly has medical consequences and the quality of life can be worse than that itself. And remember, we orthopods, I know, but we also don't just look at the bone, we look at the patient as a whole, um, we try to. Um, briefly looking at the economic impact of joint replacement and how we can play our part through rapid recovery pathway. So what, uh, what am I talking about? So the incidence of total hip and knee replacements for OA, and just looking at Australia, is set to rise drastically on 276 and 280% uh, by, two, by 2030. And so this would be a massive impact on the health system. We're looking at 5.32 billion. And the only thing that say what's our sort of guarding us from these costs is that uh, we have waiting lists of about five to six years in some of our academic hospitals for patients waiting for joint replacements. And I can tell you, I work as a part-time consultant at uh, Albert Lutuli, and the, the type of pathology just from the chronicity, chronicity of patients waiting for surgery is horrendous. And looking at what patients have to go through waiting for surgery is just atrocious. Um, we're fortunate in the private sector where patients can get you know, time, timely health care. Uh, but if we go out there to what 84% uh, of the population has to experience, it is absolutely heartbreaking. Um, combined with the fact that we're going to do more joints, or we, we, we should do more joints, 
um, the risk of complications is also going to go up. So the risk of periprosthetic joint infection is going to go up. And this is going to be a billion dollar business in the US by the year 2030. So we need to look at ways where we can mitigate these risks, but also try and save costs where we can. Right? So because there's a lot of money that's going to be spent on this. So what is rapid recovery pathway? It's a concept of rapid recovery by establishing aggressive perioperative programs with the distinct intention of speeding recovery, reducing morbidity and complications, and creating a program of efficiency. I think efficiency is a key word here. Uh, but at the same time, we don't want to compromise patient care. So we want to make sure that patient care is either the same at the very least or even better than with our standard path. So typically patients would be booked for surgery, uh, you know, they'd have not much of a pre-med, might have some blood tests, they stay in hospital, um, um, may not be as much attention paid to, to perioperative pain control using non-opioid measures uh, or um, methods of uh, reducing blood loss and avoiding transfusions. Patients generally spend a night in high care, a couple of days in the general ward, and the whole thing becomes a costly affair with about four or five days in hospital, and we try to reduce that. And it, there's, very, there's various elements of a rapid recovery pathway. So it's like a, so instead of just having patients seeing the anesthetist for the first time, they're seen by a physician or the anesthetist and or the anesthetist preoperatively optimized. Hospital admission is uh, uh, usually on the day on the morning. And if the patients are having surgery late in the day, we have staggered admissions throughout the day to, to decrease the amount of hospital stay. Uh, we also, instead of you know, starving patients from the night before and Having them come to stay in a staff state, we allow them to have clear apple juice up to two hours before surgery because we know that, you know, having the patients in the staff state is actually compromise uh, the wound healing and the recovery. There's many surgical strategies which are, which we employ nowadays, which are minimally invasive. We use tenexamic acid to control bleeding, uh, with high potential of anesthesia. Um, uh, we use a lot of uh, local infiltration with liposomal bupivacaine, etc., to control pain and decrease the opioid requirements blood management, uh, as I mentioned before. And I think the key thing and also the culmination of all these strategies comes in the early rehabilitation strategies. And effectively, what this all comes down to is having an excellent team around you. Now, we're fortunate uh, in the places that are well to, to slow, be slowly building up a uh, good team. So whenever patients come for a joint replacement, they get one of two anesthetists and they get one of two uh, physiotherapists and all of us together, um, you know, communicate very freely and openly. We give, we give each other daily updates on, on our concerns, how the patient is doing, et cetera, with the aim of getting the patients up early. When I say early, by, by about four to six hours after surgery, we get the patients out of bed, we get them standing, we get them walking, we get them moving, because we have shown that this, has, this um, is shown to have better outcomes, if not equal outcomes to having patients rest for a day or two, then getting them out of bed. The longer those patients lie in bed, the worse it is for them. So the idea is to get them out of bed and get them moving, right? Some people think this is risky, but we've shown it and many, many, many studies have shown it that rapid recovery pathways are far superior to the standard pathways which we used to follow all these years. And it's not just about cost saving. It's about reduced length of stay. It's about less blood transfusion, patients using less narcotics. You know, by about two weeks, most patients have stopped using opioid medications. They use a mild analgesic and then maybe a mild narcotic such as uh, still pain for their pain and they're able to still do the physiotherapy and the rehabilitation. Um, some studies are showing less complications, less readmissions, and increased range of motion from, from totally out parsley with rapid recovery pathways. But the most important thing is for patients, uh, I mean, is your surgeon satisfaction is that we get happy when we see our patients getting out of hospital sooner and getting back to living their lives. And just an example, this is a patient, she's 61 years old, she's got uh, hypertension, she's also got cardiac disease, she's less than 24 hours post right total after you can see she's still got uh, the crepe bandage wrapped around the leg and you can see she's got almost full extension, she's got flexion beyond 100 degrees and this is her walking oh. within, um, within I think about 12 hours after surgery and you can see there's many even minimal assistance from the physiotherapist She's happy, he's happy, and uh, she goes home within 48 hours of surgery back to her normal home, away from the possibility of nosocomial infections, away from the possibility of uh, being infected by other patients within the ward. They see us as two weeks and six weeks and three months and six months, and uh, so far, you know, studies have shown and we've shown in, in our setting that uh, these patients do a lot better, and we're able to do these operations a lot cheaper uh, than doing them through standard pathways. But essentially, as I said before, this outcome is only the result of the teamwork. I am probably, I'm just one part of the team 
and we have an excellent team around us which works together and cohesively and the most important consistently that you know um you know patient one and patient 10 get one of two anesthetists get one or two physios and in that way we get to evaluate and reevaluate ourselves and set targets for ourselves in, um, in terms of improving our outcomes thank you Thank you so much for that, Mohammed. That was such a thorough overview of the knee. I think that everyone should understand everything and not have any questions. I know you are pressed for time. So um, if anyone has any burning questions, I'll take one question. Does anyone have a question? I don't see any in the chat. You can unmute and ask as well. I think everyone's quite comfortable with everything you've said. So thank you so much for having There's one on question in the chat. Um, I think it's Fatima Dokrat. Um, okay, so <laughs> uh, considering 65 as young and prime of life, agree. I have peer factor of post-op pain, lengthy rehab, inaccurate info with regards to outcomes, limits patients' choice to have surgery earlier than later, maybe support for the research team, as you say. I, I think you raise a very, very valid point. And, um, you know, I think us as surgeons, we can't fight this crusade by ourselves, uh, which is why I love forums like this, because I think we can certainly work together. Because what I do find is that when, by the time patients come to us, which would be sort of the last stage, that they the health seeking behavior is, is, is modified. And I'm not sure whether it's, uh, I think a lot of the time it's family, um, also just misinformation. So I spend a lot of time uh, just counseling patients. I think that's what's uh, important to just make patients understand that, tell them, yes, you know, this is a big surgery. These are the possible complications, but if you do get a complication, uh, these are the things that we will do for you to try and prevent these complications. And also I myself as a joint replacement or a specialist in joint replacements, we don't work in isolation. So all the KZN joint replacement surgeons have a monthly meeting where we discuss complex cases and we share cases and we get advice from each other. We obviously, we, we, we assist each other in surgery. We, we have an open line of communication with each other. We pick up the phone if you're unsure about something really worse comes to us and touch base, it never happens to, more, to any of us that if we're stuck in surgery, we can call on each other as well. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's about teamwork and it's about education. You know, the surgery is only one aspect of that. I tell patients it's 50% surgery, it's 50% counseling, it's 50% rehabilitation. And like, yes, patients ask it, but I think if we work together as, uh, as general care practitioners, as surgeons to, to counsel these patients and reassure them, and also make them understand the consequences of not having uh, an intervention, whether it be surgery or, or other for that matter, what the consequences are. I think we can have a, a much better outcome. Yeah, and uh, you know, like some patients were unsure, you know, we, we, I, we do like another post-op, pre-op counseling session before surgery, you know, uh, if that's what they need, then that's, that's what we need to take time out to do. It's all about education. And then just one last question, what's your take on visco supplements? and collagen supplements and all of that because it's a question yeah so uh, i think visco supplementation uh the, the my personally the only reason that i kind of got a bad rap is because we should, people were using them for the wrong indications so the only indication i would use them for is for patients who still have uh some joints made or some cartilage in the joint if you're going to use it in a patient who already has end-stage arthritis where they have uh, bone on bone or almost bone on bone arthritis it's not going to work and that's why they've got a bad rap I use them very commonly, uh, for, for, especially for my young patients. Uh, I try and avoid steroids in the joint, especially in patients who I may consider for a, a unicompartmental or partial knee replacement, because what we do know is that if you're putting in steroids into a joint, you're taking away one millimeter of cartilage, right? If you're putting in a uh, steroid into a normal joint, you're increasing the risk of that patient's um, risk of getting arthritis and uh, getting a total joint replacement. So, in a nutshell, I, I really like visco supplementation. There's many options on the market. We can probably discuss the related changes, even some options now which combine a steroid. But in principle, I avoid steroids in patients who don't have any arthritis. I avoid steroids in patients who have only isolated arthritis in the patellofemoral or the lateral medial compartment. I use it in patients who have you know, tricompartmental or bicompartmental arthritis. Uh, but for the most part, I've, I've made a big move more towards visco supplementation. So I think definitely 
you know, for you, for you guys as well, you know, um, really go for it. And I use uh, it's either Superson or Synverse. I think Superson is about 500 and cheaper and that works out well for my patients. Thank you so much for this. Um, I think we can end off now because I know you've got theater to go to. So if anyone else has any questions, they can send it to me and then I'll just forward it to you or give you this. There's one thing, uh, Shabna, I'm, I'm having a problem trying to post the register. So I've actually asked, I've taken a photo of all the people that are on the chat participant. So I'll try and sort of CPD out, but they need to put their name. They can't put Galaxy 830, Galaxy 832. I have no idea who they are. Sure. Okay, so if everyone- They need to get, get this right, please. Yeah.